In this video, we're going to be doing another fairly short old actuarial exam 2 problem about time-weighted rates of return, exercise 5.2.4s in Burberman. We'll be finding the ending balance on an account when the time-weighted rates of return are known for a half year and for a full year and are actually equivalent over that full year. So we have an investor depositing 50 in an investment account in the beginning of the year, January 1st. And we've got the following summary of the activity on the account during the year that you see here. Kind of odd dates here, March 15th, June 1st, and October 1st. You've got the value immediately before the deposits that you see here. On June 30th, halfway through the year, the value of the account is 157.5. At the end of the year, December 31st, the value of the account is X. Using the time-weighted method, which once more I say is really a misnomer, it's confusing, it really doesn't weight time in any way that I can see, the equivalent effective annual yield rate during the first six months is equal to the time-weighted effective annual yield during the entire one-year period. The goal is to calculate X. All right, I think, once again, we draw a timeline, as in many situations, a timeline is very, very valuable, I think. Do need to be a little careful here. Um, well, actually, it's not such a big deal with time-weighted returns. I mean, if we were thinking about dollar-weighted or money-weighted returns, the actual times would be important. For example, March 15th, 15th of March, is technically 5 24ths of the way through a year, and that would be important if we were doing dollar-weighted method, but we are doing time-weighted method, so it's actually not important. I'll just say it's right there, and then June 1st, is right here, and then October 1st is over here, and then 31st of December is right over there. And again, the I've spaced these approximately correctly, but it's not really that big a deal. Um, I guess we do know the value on June 30th as well. That's the 30th of June right there. Let's go ahead and keep track of things here. So we start off with a deposit of 50 at time zero. The value immediately before the next deposit is going to be 40, so that 50 is going to decrease in value down to 40. Don't let the upward arrow confuse you, it is going down in value. Then I deposit 20 on March 15th, and then the value would be 60. By June 1st, it's up to a value of 80, so now it has grown. Then I deposit another 80, so the balance right after that deposit would be 160. We're told that on June 30th, the value is 157.5, so I could kind of put an intermediate 157.5 right there, though we're not going to make a deposit then. And it gets up to 175 by October 1st. Then I deposit another 75 for a balance of 250. And then at the end, the value is X, and that's the thing we ultimately have to find. That's what this X is. Okay. So we use the time-weighted method. Let's go ahead and first figure out the effective semi-annual yield from the beginning of the year to June 30th based on what we're given. So the effective semi-annual yield as a time-weighted rate of return. I've shown you in the last couple of videos how to do that. Take ratios. The 50 went down in value to 40, so the growth factor is actually a decay factor is 40 50ths for the first two and a half months, 0.8, the value is going down. You add 20 to it to a value of 60, and then that goes up to 80, so the growth factor during these two and a half months here is 80 60ths. And then we're Trying to figure it out for the first six months, so we go to June 30th here. The value goes up from 160 down to 157.5, so that's a growth factor that's less than one as well. And then you subtract one from that to get the uh, effective semi-annual yield as a time-weighted rate of return in this case. This is the same as 0.8. This is the same as 1.3 repeating. So let's go ahead and calculate this. 157.5 divided by 160 times 1.3 repeating, times 0.8, minus one is going to be 0 0.05, so the that's 5%, that's the effective semi-annual 
yield rate according to a time-weighted rate of return, the corresponding equivalent effective annual, annual yield rate, I would need to get by taking 1.05, squaring it, and subtracting 1. The equivalent effective annual yield rate, not thinking about the time-weighted rate of return over the entire year, but instead taking this 1.05, squaring it and subtracting one, you can check with your calculator, that's going to give you 0 0.1025, 10.25%. Okay, that's the equivalent effective annual yield. According to the Gibbons, that's going to be equal to the effective annual yield during the entire one-year period as a time-weighted rate of return. You might wonder, do I need to think about the June 30th amount in doing this next calculation? of the effective annual yield, again, as a time-weighted rate of return? The answer is you can, but you don't have to. Certainly, the first couple periods, we're going to have the same fractions as before, 40 80ths, or excuse me, 40 50ths, and 80 60ths. Do I need to put 157.5 over 160 and then a 175 over 157.5? I don't need to put them both. I don't need to think about this intermediate 157.5. I can just write 175, that value, over 160 because the 157.5 would cancel. Okay? So you don't have to put that in. Then the final balance is x. The ratio x divided by 250, that's going to be the growth factor over the last period here, the last three months of the year. Subtracting 1 would give you the effective annual yield as a time-weighted rate of return. Based on what we're given, that's supposed to equal this 0 0.1025. And so now it's just a matter of solving this equation for x. This again is 0.8. This is 1.3 repeating. 175 over 160. 1.09375. Let's go ahead and multiply those, and then I'll divide by 250. So 1.09375 times 1.3 repeating times 0.8. It's 1.16 with the 6 repeating. That would be 1 and 1 6. That would be, looks like 7 6 times x over 250 minus 1 equals 0 0.1025. So 7x over uh, 6 times 250 would be 1,500 equals 1.1025, multiply both sides by 1,500, 1 1.1025 times 1,500, gives 7x equal to 1653.75, now divide both sides by 7 and you're done. Divide by 7, and x turns out to be then the ending balance 236.25. Okay, and that is the correct answer for this problem where we find the ending balance based on some given time-weighted rates of return.